we find ourselves in the midst of the 2018 Winter Olympics. And for two and a half weeks, the world's attention is focused on athletes from around the globe competing in a variety of sports. Now, I think most people find themselves rooting for the athletes from their own country, though sometimes we might find ourselves kind of pulling for the underdog, or, or there might be a special story. I found myself caught up in this uh, last week with the pairs figure skating. There was a gal from Germany. This was her first fifth Olympic Games, and she had won bronze a couple of times, and, and I found myself rooting for, for her and her partner to win gold, which they actually did. But either way, we see plenty of what Jim McKay used to call the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And that agony can really be uh, bitter when you only lose out by a fraction of a second. Uh, one of the American skiers, I believe it was, came in sixth place and they were half a second behind the leader. Yeah, all the, just so much can boil down to just a, a very small amount of time or distance. And for every success story that you see standing on the medal stand, there are many more who compete in the Olympics and many who failed to make the Olympic teams that live with loss. That's what I'd like to talk about tonight, living with loss. Now, we've probably never missed out on an Olympic medal by half a second or even come close to anything like that, but we've all lived with losses of one kind or another. And the accompanying emotion to that is grief. Christian counselor Archibald Hart defines grief as a longing for something that's been lost. That's really what grief is. It's that keen awareness that something is missing in our lives. And it comes in a variety of ways, but I think at some point we're all going to experience it. The key to life is not evading loss, it's learning how to live with it. Now, again, most of us are not going to have the exact experiences of others, and I think we've got to be very careful when somebody's going through a particular loss that we neither minimize it and say, what's that all about? Come on, this, that's nothing. Nor should we say, oh, I know exactly how you're feeling, because you probably don't. Every person's experience is a little different, and their reaction to it's going to be different as well. But I do believe that we can learn about loss. We can learn about grief. And I think that during the winter months of the calendar, our emotions tend to uh, run a little deeper. We may feel that loss a little bit more. So tonight I want to consider the common suffering of grief, the, complement, the, com, the complicating sentiments of grief, and then some coping skills for grief. And again, I realize everybody's experience with loss and how they handle that is different. I'm not trying to say that we should all act exactly the same way and feel exactly the same way. I just hope that through Scripture tonight we can learn a little more about it and maybe learn uh, some things that we can either apply in our own lives or maybe help others who are going through uh, that difficult time. We don't like the word grief or grieving, but it is something we're all going to experience sometime or another. You do see of it a lot in Scripture. The Psalms have many, many references to grief. One is in Psalm 119, verse 28. I weep with grief. My heart is heavy with sorrow. Encourage and cheer me with your words. Jesus told his disciples in John 16, 20, I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while this world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. And remember, Jesus is talking to his followers here. 
Just because we come to Christ does not absolve us from loss. In fact, I think at times it makes us more keenly aware of it. It is something that is a common experience. Uh, When you go through the Bible, you read of Abraham when he lost Sarah. Jacob mourning over the loss of Joseph uh, where he thought his son had been killed. David grieving over the loss of his infant son born to Bathsheba, and later his grown sons, Amnon and Absalom. Jeremiah lamenting the king, the death of King Josiah. Especially moving is David's grief when he discovered that his friend Jonathan had been killed in battle. Isaiah introduces us to the Messiah as one who is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And even though Jesus was God in the flesh, he still felt that keen awareness of loss. We read in the shortest verse of all scripture, John 11, 35, Jesus wept as he stood at the tomb of a friend. Grief is the normal response of loss, of another person, an object, even an opportunity. It's the experience of deprivation and anxiety that can show itself in one's behavior, their emotions, their thinking. It can even affect them physically. And it can also affect our relationship with God. Grief is not limited to the loss of a loved one through death. That's what we automatically think of if somebody's grieving. Oh, someone close to them has died. But it can be a host of other things as well. Any loss can bring grief. Divorce, retirement from a job, the amputation of a limb, the departure of a child to college or marriage, a pastor moving on to another church, moving from one friendly neighborhood to another where you don't know anyone, or maybe a good neighbor of yours is moving away and there's a loss of that friendship. Losing a home to fire or another kind of disaster. Uh, The death of a pet. The loss of a contest or an athletic game. Health failures. The losing of health can bring grief. Even the loss of one's youthful appearance, confidence, or enthusiasm. Sometimes we have an anticipated event that we've longed for it and maybe it just doesn't work out it doesn't come through and we sense that loss there's even good things that can bring grief two of the saddest days of my life was when i graduated from high school and when i graduated from college because i had made great friendships and even though i'm still in touch with a few of them even over all these years i knew it would never be the same and we were all excited about graduating and we were exciting about moving moving on to the next part of our lives but there's still a sense of loss so many things can bring these feelings of grief Now, when a person moves in to the world of grief, they enter a world of unpredictability, of chaos, and pain. Each person, as they grieve, will have his or her own unique experience of it, but there are some common threads that I think we can learn about and help us greater understand. When we're in grief, it just feels like the bottom has fallen out of our world. You may sense that you're falling and falling and falling and you never land. You never hit anything. You just keep falling. You wonder how long that can last. The stability of of yesterday's emotions is gone because we like our familiarity, don't we? We, we? We get comfortable in our routines. And when our routines are shattered because we've lost something close to us. It's very unsettling. You wonder what's going to happen next. It's it's a very uh, uncomfortable position to be in. 
those basic needs of security and significance that we've talked about. They're shaken. We wonder, even sometimes, where is God in all of this? It can even shake our faith. That's normal. Don't be alarmed. That's a very normal reaction to loss. Mourning is a part of the experience. Ecclesiastes 3.4 tells us there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And this is the process by which grief is expressed. Grief is the emotion, mourning is the action. It's how grief is expressed. And it is a natural, God-given process of recovery. You can even say that it is God's gift to us so that the pain of loss can heal. And I think there are many, especially men, who have been taught that men don't cry and men don't show their emotions and men don't let on that something's bothering them. They often keep the healing process from happening because we don't express our grief. We bottle it up inside and it actually makes things worse. You cannot make your grief better instantaneously. You just can't will it away. You can't fix it. You can't just get over it. <laughs> I usually don't turn to uh, television shows for my theology, but I did hear a line on NCIS that I thought was really good. And somebody had asked the main character who had experienced loss in his life, how do you get over it? And he said, you don't get over it, you get through it. That's very profound. That's the only way that you can deal with grief. You can't get over it. You can't get around it. You have to get through it. And you get through it one day at a time. Grief and mourning are part of the Christian experience as well. We are not insulated from pain or loss in this life. We are going to experience it. We take comfort in the peace that comes from God and the certainty that those who are in Christ we will see again. But we still mourn. We still grieve. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism for they've died, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Now that does not mean we are not to grieve. That is not to mean that Christians cannot show sorrow or they cannot shed a tear. We grieve differently. I've heard some preachers try to say, we should not grieve. And they'll go to a funeral service and say, this is a celebration of life. This should be a happy time. We grieve. We just don't grieve as those who have no hope. That's the difference. It's not that we don't grieve at all. It's we grieve differently. We grieve with an eternal perspective. And even though death is swallowed up in victory through the resurrection of Christ, we still feel the loss. And I tell folks at a, at a funeral service or a visitation time, when, when, a, when a Christian has died, we don't mourn for them. We know where they are, and we know that they're no longer suffering or in pain. We mourn for ourselves. We are the ones who have lost, because that person is no longer going to be in our life here on earth. And there's nothing wrong with that. doesn't mean that your faith is weak. It doesn't mean that your spirituality is questionable. It means you're human. It means you have the capacity to love and to care because our grief is in direct proportion to how much we love and we care. When you read of somebody that passes away and you don't know them, you may feel badly for their family, but it doesn't really affect you that much. But when it's someone close to you, when it's a family member, a close friend, it touches us much deeper. 
And again, as Christians, we should have a greater capacity for grief than the rest of the world because we are called to love. Now, one of the worst things we can do for someone who's grieving is to slap them on the back and quote a verse like Romans 8.28 and say, time to get over it, turn that frown upside down and praise the Lord. You may get slugged. These days you might get shot. That is not a good way to approach somebody in grieving. And you know, many well-intentioned Christians have actually done more harm than good trying to get people to short-circuit the experience of grief. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to support one another and help one another get through it. Not around it, not over it. We get through it. Now, as I've said, loss is inevitable. Grief is natural. But sometimes there are complicating sentiments that compound the mourner's sorrow. The grief process is made up of multitude of emotions that seem out of control and, and seem to be in conflict with each other. In addition to mourning the loss, we'll feel things like bitterness, fear, emptiness, apathy, anger, guilt, self-pity, feelings of helplessness or hopelessness. These can complicate our grief. These can come at different times and they have to be worked through. We may have unfinished business. There are plans or dreams for the future. Maybe there were conversations we intended to have and now we can't have them anymore. There's the end of what we expected to take place in the next five years. If we lose something suddenly, we don't have the time to say or do the things that we wanted to do. If the death was of a child, we, we mourn the loss of opportunity to see that person grow up into maturity. We may experience the continuing effect of a painful relationship. Sometimes when we lose someone close to us, and maybe it was a family member, but we really didn't get along with them. They hurt us in some way in the past, and that was never resolved. And feelings that maybe we had pushed way back into our soul, and we didn't think we'd have to deal with them anymore, all of a sudden they're coming to the forefront. Bitterness, resentment, hurt, anger. And then we feel guilty because we're angry at someone who just died, right? Talk about complicating emotions. I think guilt is one of the big ones that complicates grief. We feel somehow responsible. Oh, we could have done something else. We should have done something different. Oh, if I had just said this or done this or, or whatever it was, this loss wouldn't have taken place. And again, it doesn't have to be the loss of a person. Any of the losses we have in life, we second-guess ourselves. We try to go back and say, oh, if only I had. Well, guess what? You can't. We, we cannot change it. And maybe we were at part responsible. Maybe there is something we could have done better. When guilt compounds grief, it's much more difficult to work through the grieving process. And the answer is not to keep beating yourself up over what you could have done and didn't do and might have done and this, that, and the other thing. The key is you find forgiveness. You say, well, that person's not here anymore to ask forgiveness. You get forgiveness from God. No one can forgive sins but God. Now, if we offend somebody, we can go and say we're sorry, and they can say, I forgive you. They haven't forgiven us the sin. They have forgiven us the hurt we caused them. Only God forgives sin. And if there's some culpability that we have, we can find forgiveness at the throne of mercy. 
And I'm not saying that's going to make all of our feelings go away, but that's where we need to begin. And then when those guilt feelings come in along with our grief, we have to tell ourselves the truth. This has been forgiven. God has taken care of it. I'm not going to carry it anymore. That's something a lot of Christians need to start doing. We are weighed down by decisions we've made in the past or didn't make. And when we find the forgiveness through Christ, we do need to let that go. We need to tell ourselves the truth. An example that you find of this in Scripture, and I mentioned it earlier, it's in 2 Samuel 18, when David learned of the death of his son Absalom. Now let me give you a little background into Absalom, all right? He was one of David's sons. He was a good-looking young man and uh, very charming, very smart, probably the best and the brightest of David's sons until Solomon came along. But Absalom had some issues. He had some anger issues. He had a a half-brother that violated his sister. And when his father didn't do anything about it, he took matters into his own hands and had that half-brother killed. He was a murderer. He was getting a little bit tired of waiting for dear old dad to kick off so he could become king. So he decided to take matters into his own hands and declare himself king. And in essence, ran David out of town. When you read through the story, David had to run out of Jerusalem for his life. He was a fugitive while Absalom set up shop in the palace. But when the time came and David's army defeated Absalom's army and hunted the young man down and killed him, David's response, it says, the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Those of you that have lost a child, or somebody that close to you. You know how that feels. But David was not only grief-stricken, he was guilt-ridden. And that just complicated and compounded the grieving process. And I find in my experience, this is the one complicating sentiment that you see the most is guilt. What we could have done, should have done, would have done differently. Oh, if I could do it all over again. Now you will find some that try to pin the blame on others and they get angry, but more often than not, people pin the blame on themselves and feel guilty. And they carry that with them. And like I said, at times they could be right. <laughs> there may have been things they could have done differently. So if there is responsibility, own it. Acknowledge where you may have fallen short. Ask for forgiveness. Learn from it. We must learn to forgive ourselves. In my book on forgiveness, I, the last, next to last chapter is the hardest person to forgive. You know who the hardest person to forgive is? The one you look at in the mirror. <laughs> hardest person to forgive is yourself. Because we're harder on ourselves than we are anybody else. But as a Christian, we can find that forgiveness. Not only from God, but we can forgive ourselves. And you may be able down the road to share your experience with others and maybe it'll help them. Maybe it'll help them avoid a situation that you experienced or maybe they've been through it and now they know somebody else has too. And you can show them the way. Now if there was nothing you could have done about the situation, admit it. You know, there's very, very little we actually control in life. We like to think that we control a lot. We don't. So much of life is out of our hands. It's somebody else's decision. 
It's something completely out of our control. We have to admit that. And I think the sooner we learn that, the better off we're going to be. Sometimes we try to do something to change the outcome, and it didn't impact the situation the way we wanted to. We may have done everything right, and it still came out wrong. Something I've had to share with, with our fire department on a number of occasions. We may go to a call, and it might be a medical call, or it might be a fire, and we do everything by the book. Everything was done just right. Our response times were good. Everybody worked together. We did it by the book. And the patient still died. Or that house was still lost. And I've told our guys over and over again, don't judge your success by the results. Because again, so many things are outside of our control and you can do your best and it still comes up short. That's not your responsibility. That is not your blame. And we need to come to the point where we can live with what we've done and you leave the rest in God's hands. That's part of faith. That's part of trust. Guilt weakens us. It delays us in our recovery more than probably anything else. We become very negative towards ourselves, and that spills into our negativity towards others. Now, guilt is just one complicating sentiment of grief. Like I said, there may be anger and bitterness and resentment and other emotions going on. That can delay grief. It can intensify grief. It can prolong it. And it's very important that we can express these various emotions that accompany grief. Find somebody you can trust that's not going to be judgmental of you. They're not going to condemn you for the way you feel, but they're going to be wise enough that they can help you walk through this valley. That's where I want to conclude our message tonight with some coping skills for grief. I am convinced this is a major lack in our culture today. I firmly believe this is why we see this explosion of substance abuse in our country. People are turning to drugs and alcohol to deaden the pain of life because they can't handle life. They can't cope. And unfortunately, Christians are sometimes no better at coping than the unbelieving world. We need to learn how to cope with life. Grief does not build character. Maybe you've heard that sometimes. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Grief does not build character. It reveals character. It shows you what you have and who you are. It shows you the strength of your faith. Even if you have good coping skills, you may discover that what worked before isn't working right now when you're in the midst of loss. And you might have to adjust. Sometimes that onslaught of emotions paralyzes us. <laughs> and, and we find we can't even make the most simple decisions. People stand in front of their closet and have no idea what they're going to wear that day. And it doesn't even really matter, but they just they can't, they can't make a decision. They don't know what they're going to eat. They're, they're just paralyzed. And we, we need to be able to work through and get back into the day-to-day -day living. And I really believe the best way to cope with loss is to prepare for loss. You say, that's crazy. How can I prepare for something that hasn't happened? How can I expect the unexpected? And it's true. We don't know the specifics of the losses we're going to experience. We do not know who in our lives may be taken from us. Very suddenly and unexpectedly or maybe after a prolonged illness. We don't know. We don't know about our own health. 
We don't know about our possessions. We don't know about our career. Things could come to an end very quickly. And we don't know when, and we don't know how, and we don't know where. But there are some things we do know. And I think that as we can learn to understand these things and accept these things, it will help us at the time. We need to learn what to expect in life and that loss is a regular, natural part of life. It's going to happen. And we need to build a biblical perspective on life. For the Christian, your theology will affect how you respond to loss. Your response is going to be determined by our understanding of God. The Bible tells us that our lives here on earth are brief. James 4.14 says, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Our possessions are temporary. Paul says in 2 Timothy 6.7, we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. You'll never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You can't take it with you. And yet, we're so shocked when we hear that someone is dying or someone has died. Someone will come up to me and say, I'm so afraid so-and-so is going to die. And I look at them and say, newsflash, they're going to die. I'm not trying to be cruel. I'm not trying to be funny. We just need to wake up to the fact that every single one of us is going to die. And every person that's close to you is going to die. It may be in your lifetime and it may not be, but they're going to die. We don't know when. We don't know under what circumstances. But it is a fact of life. We are going to die, and so is everybody else. And when we can start to wrap our minds around that fact, it's going to help us when the time comes. Somebody told me this last week, human beings are the only animals that know they're going to die but expect to live forever. Right? Isn't that true? I don't know that the animal world has, an ant- has a knowledge or an anticipation of their own death, but we do, and yet we are the biggest deniers of death anywhere in the world. And we think that everybody is going to live forever. You know, so-and-so's sick, so-and-so's in the hospital, they're getting tests. Oh, 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 they just can't die. Folks, they're going to die. Whether it's through this illness or as a result of this surgery or whatever, we're all going to die. We need to wake up to that fact. I believe it was Alexander the Great had a slave in his one job every morning was to whisper in his ear, Alexander, remember, you are mortal. And that's not being morbid. It's being realistic. We're going to die, and so is everybody around us. And everything around us is going to happen. We need to face reality. I'm not saying always dwell on death, okay? I'm not saying become obsessed with death. But be realistic about it. We need to understand that it is a part of our world. Learn to hold things loosely. And that includes other people. Allow God to work out his plan. We don't understand it. We're never going to. We don't always agree with it. That's okay. He's God. We put our trust in him. When you do... Experience loss, grieve fully. So many people cut the process short or deny it altogether. Express your sadness. Let the tears flow. Talk about your loss. Say how you feel and don't be ashamed of it. Admit your feelings. Don't try to hurry through that time. And don't try to hurry anybody else through it either. Maybe you got over the loss of a parent or a sibling or a child in three and a half weeks. Don't expect everybody else to. It may take some months, years. 
And to be honest, you never get over it, you get through it. Allow others that opportunity as well. Plan thoughtfully. You see this in the case of Abraham when his wife Sarah died. He had a plan for where he wanted Sarah to be buried. He bought a cave. It became a monument. It became a place of remembrance for the whole family. And that place became a rallying point in generations to come. A memorial. Those are good things. Communicate clearly. If you have preferences regarding your own death and how that's to be handled, say so. I think it's a wonderful thing how many funeral homes these days are uh, advertising. You can pre-plan your arrangements. I think it's great. For one thing, it's the one way that you're going to guarantee it's going to be done the way you want it to. And it takes an awful lot of pressure over your loved ones at the time of your passing who are probably caught up in emotions and maybe don't have the capacity to make some of those decisions. Communicate clearly. Don't be afraid to talk about death. Don't be afraid to talk about it to your children, to one another. Communicate. And by all means, communicate with those you love on a regular basis because you never know when their time will come and you never know when your time will come. We can prevent a lot of the regret that complicates grief by saying those things and doing those things that we want to say and do. Don't wait. They may not have tomorrow. You may not have tomorrow. Take care of those things and value dignity. Whether it's your own or somebody else's. Let somebody else grieve. Understand that they might be going through a number of emotions. They might be angry. They might scream and yell. They might say things that you think are on the edge of blasphemy. Don't judge. Help them through. Give them the love and the support they need. Walk with them. We are so life-oriented. We don't want to talk about death. We don't want to think about death. I think it's healthy that we understand where death fits in to our world. God has given us laughter and joy, but he's also given us the capacity to cry. Why? Because he knew there would be pain and sorrow in this life. And sometimes there is nothing more refreshing than a good cry. And yeah, you heard a guy say that. Sometimes that's what we need. It's good for the soul. And it's good to have other people around us who aren't going to mock us, who aren't going to criticize or ridicule, but they're there to comfort, they're there to encourage, they're there to lift you up. You might ask, how will I know when my grief is over? It's probably never really over. But you can see some signs of progress. You begin to look outside of yourself at others and your family and how they're handling the loss. Grief sometimes can make us pretty inward and, and quite frankly, pretty self-centered. When you see yourself wondering about how others are handling it, how others are doing, that's, that's a sign that you're beginning to work through your grief. You no longer feel the need to escape your emotions. You feel more comfortable about your grief and you're willing to talk about it. That is a huge step, being able to talk about your emotions, how you feel. When you have a day without emotional stress, you know that you're starting the process of, of healing. You can discuss and experience memories, good and bad, without the overwhelming emotions. You're able to laugh about the things that we're funny about that person, and it doesn't make you cry. <laughs> you're, you're able to you know, 
listen to that song on the radio that reminds you of that person, it brings a smile to your face. These are signs that we're beginning to heal. You realize that no matter what happened, you can live with it. You did your best. Maybe you didn't. But you don't live in the constant if-onlys and what-ifs. What you see new or renewed meaning in your life again. You start making plans again. That's one step, I think, that is so refreshing for a person that's going through loss and grief. When they start thinking about tomorrow and next week and next month and next year, because in the, in the depths of it, you don't want to think about tomorrow. You're so caught up in how you feel right now, you can't even see past where you are. But when you can start planning ahead, when, when you start looking to the future, that's a good sign. That's a sign that we're working through our grief. That doesn't mean it's over. It doesn't mean you're not going to have sad days. But it does mean that you're progressing normally and in a healthy manner. Grief's a universal experience. Uh, some are trapped by it. Some never get out of it. And I think the best thing we can do is to work through it and help each other walk through it. Prayerfully, scripturally, lovingly, tenderly. We are to weep with those who weep as well as rejoice with those who rejoice. And sometimes it's in those times where we weep together that the most healing can come. How do we live with loss? Understand what it is. Understand that loss is very normal. It's going to happen. You can almost expect it so that when it does happen, it doesn't throw us off quite so badly. And then when we do experience it, and when we are in those times of grief, express it. Work through it. Don't try to bottle it up and bury it somewhere. That's never going to work. That's always an unhealthy idea. Find ways that you can appropriately, and I will say safely, express how you feel. That means building good friendships now that will be there in your time of need. And always remember, God knows our sorrows. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knows what it's like to lose somebody close. And he's there for you. Let's bow together as we close in prayer tonight. Father, we live in a world that is filled with pain and loss. And just because we're your children does not make us immune to those experiences of sadness. We've all dealt with grief. Some of us may still be dealing with grief in our lives right now. It is my prayer that tonight, through the truth of your word, maybe we've shown a light on what grief is and, and how best to live with it. I pray that you would continue to teach us how to have a, a truly godly perspective on life. That we might hold our possessions and our relationships loosely, knowing that it's really out of our control. And may we come alongside one another as we're walking through the valleys and, and walk with them together. Give us the right words to say and the right way to say it. And give us the wisdom to know sometimes when the best words are no words at all. I pray that we would be that caring community that loves one another and lifts one another up. So that we can all live with the losses of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.